After the last visit to the Mesopotamian netherworld, today it's time to have a look at Anatolian and Iranian beliefs about the afterlife. Our knowledge of the Hittite netherworld is unfortunately very limited. The sources are very sparse and do not yield much information on this issue. In the following video, we will simply try to give you an overview of what is actually known. Hittite beliefs about the netherworld, as they have come down to us, were influenced by true traditions. Firstly, there is the Hatti tradition. What is the Hatti tradition? Well, when the Hittites arrived in Anatolia around 2000 BCE, they encountered an already existing Anatolian civilization, the Hatti civilization. The Hittites embraced its culture and adopted many religious and literary aspects of it. Secondly, there is the Syro Mesopotamian tradition and it's this tradition that exerts the most influence on Hittite beliefs about the afterlife. The principal deities of the netherworld venerated by the Hittites have a Hatti origin. Lelwani, king of the netherworld, and Eshtan, the sun goddess of the earth. Both deities, however, underwent zero Mesopotamian influence with regard to their identities. Eshtan was identified with Ereshkigal, the Mesopotamian netherworld goddess, and with Alani, a Syrian netherworld divinity. Lelwani originally was a male god, but under the influence of the Syro Mesopotamian netherworld goddess Alatum, he came to be represented as a female goddess in the 14th century BCE. With her new gender identity, Lelwani was the ruler of the netherworld and had a circle of minor deities around her. Among them are two divinities whose role as netherworld divinity was to fix the time of death. There is also a habit of calling the netherworld gods simply the Twelve Gods, without any names. This practice doesn't seem to have a Hatti origin, but rather a zero anatolian one. The specifically Mesopotamian elements in Hittite views on the, nether on the netherworld are the following. Firstly, the Hittite netherworld was, as in Mesopotamia, a dark place, as its name Gloomy Earth suggests. The Hittites considered the earth and the netherworld as one cosmic unity opposed to heaven. Secondly, the parallelism between the world of the living and the world of the dead. The netherworld was organized like a society with netherworld divinities as rulers, a state apparatus and the subjects who were the deceased persons. Thirdly, some of the officials in the high tide netherworld. Namtar, the vizier, and Gilgamesh, the governor. And finally, the belief that the sun goddess of the earth passed each day over the earth before setting in the west and crossing the netherworld during the night. Natural holes formed the entrance to the netherworld. Not surprisingly, animals that were sacrificed to the netherworld deities were slaughtered in pits. But in the end, not much, not much is known about the netherworld as the realm of the dead. Fortunately, more is known about the ancient Iranian netherworld. The study of this netherworld must be divided into two parts. We will start with a brief discussion of the Elamite representation of the netherworld and then present the beliefs about the afterlife of the ancient Iranians themselves. The latter can be subdivided into two periods, pre-Zoroastrian and Zoroastrian. The netherworld beliefs of the Elamites are little known and much of the available research on this topic has been conducted by myself here at the Institut Orientaliste de Louvain. It is known now that Inshushinak was the king of the netherworld and that the gods Ishme Karab and Lagamal were also connected with it. Due to a lack of sources, however, other information is almost impossible to find. But fortunately for us, a group of seven texts found in a tomb at Susa tells us more about the journey to the netherworld and about the netherworld itself. The first three texts run as follows. Let's go, my God, my Lord. 
May I present myself before the Anunnaki? May I pass along the weighing? And may I take your hand in the presence of the great gods? May I hear the judgment? May I grab your feet? You will take me to the house of darkness, my God. You will make me pass up and down a swamp of misery and hardship. In a territory of distress, you will look for me. You have rarefied water and pasture in this land of thirst. They have taken the road. They go their way. Ishmikarev and Lagamal go in front. In Shushinak, in the pit, will proclaim the judgment. He will stand before the weigher. He will pronounce his declaration. They have blessed the recumbent one, the important people. Those who possessed land, who possessed sheep and goods, and who did not have rivals. In Shushinak, in the pit, will proclaim the judgment. He will stand before the weigher. He will pron pronounce his declaration. Look at me, who has descended in a black cloud. As the city of Susa had a mixed Mesopotamian and Elamite culture, it's not surprising to see elements of both cultures appearing in the texts. Mesopotamian elements are the Anunnaki, the House of Darkness, the Swamp of Misery, the Land of Thirst, and perhaps the Black Cloud. Elamite elements are the netherworld character of the gods Inshushinak, Ishmekarab, and Lagamal, the weighing and the judgment. It must be stressed that the weighing in this case has nothing to do as such with the Egyptian weighing ceremony. It could be connected, however, with the weighing of the soul or the heart as mentioned in the biblical books of Job and Proverbs. It is not probable that there was any Elamite influence on ancient Iranian beliefs about the afterlife. The main source for these is the Avesta, the corpus of Zoroastrian sacred texts. According to pre-Zoroastrian beliefs, the soul lingered on earth for three days after a person's death. After this short period, it started its ascent to the crossing of the separator, the Chinvato Peratu, a bridge which the deceased had to cross to reach paradise. On the way, it was met by a female figure called Daena, which was young and beautiful for righteous people, but old and ugly for evil people. This meeting with the Daena already indicated what fate the soul could expect. At the crossing of the separator, the Daena directed the soul to its future home. Either paradise, a place full of light and happiness, or the netherworld. The netherworld was situated beneath the earth and was a shadowy and gloomy place where the disease enjoyed a great continuance. It is very important to realize that righteousness was not an ethical concept in pre-Zoroastrian Arawan, but a cultic one. Those who had acquired merit in the sight of the gods, mainly by keeping prescribed observances and by sacrificing, were more likely to reach paradise. They succeeded in crossing the Chinvato Peratu, whereas the evil people, who had neglected their duties towards the gods, fell from it into the shadowy netherworld. When Zoroaster preached his religion, he seems to have adopted and further developed these ancient beliefs. Two changes are important, however. A third place, hell, is now created and the ethical aspect henceforth replaces the cultic one. Arrived at the crossing of the separator, the Chinvato Peretu, the soul was subjected to a moral judgment in which each man's own words and deeds were weighed on a balance. Clearly the judgment has become an ethical judgment now, because if the good actions outweighed the evil ones, the soul could cross the Chinvato Peretu and continue its journey towards paradise. If, however, the bad actions were heavier than the good ones and the soul appeared to be wicked, it was sent to hell a dwelling place of worst purpose. 
If good and evil acts were of the same amount, the soul was sent to a third place, the place for the mixed ones, an abode of shadows comparable to the pre zoroastrian netherworld, a place lacking joy, sorrow or other emotions. This is basically what we can tell you about ancient Anatolia and Iran with regard to the afterlife and the netherworld. In the next video, we will discover how these things were depicted in ancient Greek epics.